Did you know that Baldur's Gate 3 offers some really unique items and sets that will actually create builds of their own for your characters? Despite Baldur's Gate 3 having over 40 different subclasses along with a super in-depth character customizer, no one playthrough will ever be the same. And if you add these really fun item sets that you can get in Acts 1, 2, and 3, you can really change the way your character plays. And that's what today's video is all about, talking about itemization to really enhance your gameplay and create fun builds for you and your friends. Before we dive in, note I will mainly showcase items from Acts 1 and 2, but did want to reference some things in Act 3 as well, so if you consider gear a spoiler, I suppose now is your warning. If you enjoy my content and you end up liking this video, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel. I am trying to grow the channel and majority of the people that watch my content aren't actually subscribed. So if you like this stuff, go ahead and sub to me, man. It could really help the channel grow. Thanks in advance. Before showcasing where the items are located and how they work, I do want to first put them in the category so you can understand how they will actually interact with each other as well as any potential builds that you'll make for your class. The first one is going to be gimmicks or mechanics. These are going to be items usually found in sets that have special functionality that will fundamentally change the way you approach combat. For example, the heat mechanic allows you to build up stacks of heat upon yourself to then do additional fire damage during heat convergence. So this category would consist of lightning charges, heat convergence, radiating orbs, reverberation, encrusting frost, in Venom, and lastly, Stealth slash Obscured. The next category is self-explanatory, but it's going to be for supportive options. So these will be items that will make you a better healer or make you a better support option for your group. This will range from buffs, heals, and more. The last category is kind of miscellaneous. These are going to be items that don't really fit in any other category but will interact well with other items in this video to give you direct damage boost to your spells, melee attacks, or range attack with bows. And if you do want to see any specific builds, including any items or concepts we talk about in this video, definitely comment down below because I love making requested build videos and I would love to make one for you. So let's go ahead and dive in, starting with one of my personal favorites, Encrusting Frost. As you can guess from the name, Encrusting Frost revolves around dealing cold damage to build stacks of frost. You want to stack this debuff as soon as you can because once you get it to 7 stacks or turns remaining of frost, the enemy must make a constitution saving throw or they take additional cold damage and they become frozen. While frozen, they lose their actions and reactions. Additionally, you can basically shatter the ice with bludgeoning, thunder, and or force damage, removing the debuff but the damage you do with those types will actually be doubled. Enemies with Encrusting Frost also have disadvantage on deck saving throws. Items that apply are the following. You have the Winter's Clutches Gloves. These apply two turns of Encrusted Frost whenever you deal cold damage. You have the Cold Brim Hat, which applies two turns of Encrusted Frost when applying a condition to the enemy. And this can be found behind the bookcase inside Balthazar's chambers inside Act 2 at Moonrise Towers. But I did also want to mention two other items found within Acts 1 and 2 that pair exceptionally well with the items listed above. That would be the Snowburst Ring, which applies a field of ice whenever you deal cold damage. This is found in a hidden floor panel with inside Last Light's Inn. And you have the Morning Frost, which is a purple staff that you can actually create fairly early on inside Act 1. This staff will give you Ray of Frost as a cantrip if you already don't know it. Anytime you deal frost damage, you deal additional damage. And whenever you cast a frost spell, you have a chance to chill the target, making them vulnerable to cold damage, meaning the cold damage you do will now be doubled. However, if they do have this debuff, they can become resistant to fire instead. To make the staff, you will need to combine three pieces. You have basically the hilt, the metal, and the ice crystal, which are all found within the Underdark. The crystal is dropped by an NPC, which can be found here on the map. 
the actual like metal piece is dropped by a drow named Dorn. You can find him next to the outpost where you have the spectator fight. And the last piece can be achieved in two different ways. You can use Missy's step to basically teleport behind these vines and loot it yourself. Or you can complete the quest chain, defeat the Dwegar intruders to retrieve it that way. And if you actually do this quest, it will lead to a second quest called Avenge Glut Circle. And this quest will actually reward the Winter Clutch's gloves. But you could also just buy the gloves from the vendor here at the start of the mountain pass as well. Don't worry, if you missed out on some of these items, you can actually find the helm and the gloves in Act 3 still. Uh, you can get these in the shop where you get the legendary staff next to a lava elemental. There are a few different spellcaster builds you can use for these items for, but honestly, I really had a blast in Acts 1 and 2 on my Eldritch Knight with this as well. And an honorable mention to the Pack of the Blade Lock with this too. Let's move on to radiating orbs. I want you to think about these orbs as spotlights to help kind of like blind your enemies. They give your enemies a negative one stacking modifier to their attack rules, meaning the chance for them to hit you is going to be less. These orbs shed bright light and are considered daylight, so this will have bonus effects against creatures with sunlight weakness or sensitivity as well. What I really like though is the fact that if you have multi-hitting attacks, you can actually stack this like radiant orb kind of like debuff multiple times in one turn which can lead to some really heavy modifiers on the enemy and when paired with some of the items we talk about down below you can get some additional damage too so items that actually create the orbs or interact with them are going to be the following a you have the Kalos glow ring this deals two radiant damage against illuminated targets and this can be abused to hit multiple times in one round you find this in the vault room near Balthasar while exploring the Gauntlet of Shar. Next you have the Luminous Armor. This causes a Radiant Shockwave when dealing Radiant Damage and it actually applies the Orb Effect in a 10 foot radius. This chest piece can be found within the Outpost in the Underdark. You can get here pretty easy if you go through the Goblin Camp. You have the Luminous Gloves. And these apply one orb directly when dealing radiant damage. And these are found within the ruined battlefield inside Act 2 within a potter chest. Next you have the Coruscation Ring. And this applies a radiant orb for two turns when you deal spell damage while illuminated. This is found in a secret area of Last Light's Inn. Basically go through the doors then behind a cracked wall will be a chest and you can find it in that chest Of course, you have Blood of Lathander, the Legendary Mace. This doesn't actually directly apply the orbs in any way, but I did want to mention it because it has its own illumination effect, as well as a really powerful spell Sunbeam. So basically, you'll be applying those orbs indirectly by just having this weapon equipped. Other weapons that would actually benefit from this as well would include the Sacred Star weapon, which you get inside Act 3. Not only does this do additional radiant damage, but on a melee hit, it will inflict one turn of radiant orbs as well. And this is sold by a vendor inside the Stormshore Tabernacle. When you think about the radiating orb effects and how they interact with things, I'm sure clerics and paladins come to mind first. And yeah, they work exceptionally well with this, but you'd be surprised what other type of build you can make with this concept as well. Lastly, I did want to mention a item here called the Holy Lance Helm, which is found inside the Mountain Pass. With all the orb stacking you're going to be doing, more than likely enemies are going to miss their attacks at some point in time. And when they do, this helm will cause radiant damage to the attacker if they fail a deck saving throw. 
And because it's radiant damage, it applies the orb as well if you use the other items mentioned earlier. Reverberation is a debuff that when applied will give the enemy a negative one penalty to strength, dexterity, and constitution saving throws per turn. And similar to the orbs, it can stack. At five stacks, the target has to make a constitution saving throw. If they fail it, not only will they take additional thunder damage, but they will also be knocked prone. And when you attack an enemy that is prone, you have advantage on your attacks. Items that apply or interact with this are going to be the following. You have the Gloves of Belligerent Skies. Whenever you deal lightning, thunder, or radiant damage, you inflict two turns of reverberation. This can be found within the Inquisitor's Chamber with the Githyanki at the Mountain Pass. You have these boots here. And these are cool because whenever you inflict a condition on a hostile creature, you also inflict two turns of reverberation. And these are sold by this vendor here after completing his quest to investigate the parasite. Basically, talk to Blurg at the Mushroom Colony. He brings over his Flayer friend, accept the quest from the Flayer, then go to the Arcane Tower and collect the spores and flowers. You have the Ring of Absolute Force. And this basically just gives you Thunder Wave spell you can use once per short rest for free. And if you are marked by the Absolute, which you can brand yourself inside Act 1, you deal additional damage anytime you deal Thunder spell damage and attacks. You loot this from the Dwarf here inside Grimforge, Sergeant Thryn. You have the Thunderskin Cloak. Whenever a creature with Reverberation deals damage to you, they need to make a constitution saving throw, and if they fail, they become dazed. Dazed causes the enemy to have disadvantage on wisdom saving throws, and they can't make reactions. They also lose any dex bonuses to their AC. And this is sold by the Drow Araj inside Moonrise Towers. Quick side note about this NPC, if you have a Sterion in your group and you let him bite her, you will receive a permanent stat boost potion to increase your strength by 2, meaning you can get your strength to 22. And lastly, you have the Ring of Spiteful Thunder. Whenever you deal thunder damage to a target already affected by the debuff, it becomes dazed unless they succeed a constitution saving throw. And this is sold by Royal Moonglow, also within Moonrise Towers. I did want to give an honorable mention to the amulet you find inside Grimforge. Even though this is really good for monks, it does give you the shatter spell for free. So it's another way to just have additional free thunder damage. Also, the longsword that you find inside the Underdark fairly early on uh, next to the outpost. This thing has an amazing skill. Uh, one of them is allowing to basically do a debuff to your enemies. So that enemy within range will take additional thunder damage and is considered a condition. This really stacks well with the other things mentioned. What I also really like about reverberation is you can combine this with some of the other mechanics in the game and it works really well. For example here you can see I'm doing encrusting frost but because of my boots I am also applying reverberation at the same time. When you play with fire you're going to get burned. That is 100% the concept of heat convergence and the heat mechanic in Baldur's Gate 3. The way this works is you actually put stacks of heat upon yourself up to a max of 7. You can then choose to consume all the stacks of heat convergence, allowing you to deal additional fire damage next time you would actually deal fire damage to your attacks. So this is really cool because multi-hitting spells like Scorching Ray can cause multiple heat stacks to actually count per turn. But when you use Heat Convergence, only the first hit of that spell will have the bonus damage. On the other hand, however, AoE spells like Fireball that only hit once but hit in an AoE will have the bonus damage applied to all targets that it hits, so you can have like a really powerful AoE Firebomb. The bonus damage from Heat Convergence will also apply to any weapon attacks that deal bonus fire damage as well. The downside of this concept is though, when you gain heat, you actually take fire damage per turn, it's 1d4, while maintaining the buff, 
So this is something useful to have on tieflings in my opinion since tieflings do have built in fire resistance. And as an honorable mention, if you do happen to have Minthara, she has a built in unique ability to allow teammates to do additional fire damage on their turn. Okay, so let's talk about some items that are definitely going to interact with this mechanic. You have the Cinder Shoes. Whenever you burn a target, you gain two sacks of heat. This is actually found inside Act 1. You can buy this from Blurge inside the Mushroom Colony in the Underdark. The Fireheart Necklace. Whenever you take fire damage from another creature, you gain two turns of heat. This is located inside a chest inside the Toll House. The player has to basically break a vine or jump up through a window and then you can find it inside the hidden room. You have the Ring of Self Emulation. As a bonus action, you can set yourself on fire to gain heat for two turns. And this is looted inside a locked wooden chest inside the ruined battlefield. And if you don't have lock picking, there is a skeleton nearby that does have a key to open it. You do have the Thermo Arcanic Gloves, and these are really good because they pair really well with some weapons. So whenever you deal fire damage, you gain two turns of heat, and this is looted off of the orc that you meet during the quest for the lantern. You definitely want to kill him. Um, I haven't figured out a way to get it any other way other than making sure he dies. You have the Thermo Dynamo Axe. So this is really cool because this is an axe you can buy from Damon inside Act 2. And basically, whenever you deal weapon damage with that axe, you gain two turns of heat. If you pair this with the gloves, you already have four turns of heat from one attack. And martial classes get two attacks at level five, so you can stack it up really quick. In Act 3, you have the Hellfire Great Axe. You gain two turns of heat whenever you deal weapon damage with this weapon, so very similar to the previous axe that I just mentioned. However, this weapon has its own unique weapon skill called Hellflame Cleave, and while you use that weapon skill, it ignores resistances and immunity to fire damage. This is found in the Sorcerer's Sundries. Uh, basically, you enter the Silverhand door and you destroy the door labeled Illusion and you will find the chest with inside. If you enter any other way, I don't know if it's glitched or intended, but it won't be there. You have to destroy the illusion door. Honorable mention here, the demon boss inside Shar's Gauntlet will drop the Hellfire Hand Crossbow, and this will allow you to cast Scorching Ray as a third level spell once per short rest. And if you're hiding, you have a chance to burn your enemy when attacking. Side note, Damon also sells a bow inside Act 2 that gives you haste as a spell, but this will also give you fire resistance as well in case you're playing as a character that doesn't have it normally. So if you're not a tiefling, having this bow equipped will at least give you some fire resistance as well. Next we have lightning charges, and these are exactly what it sounds like. You gain charges of lightning. This is a buff on yourself that will give you plus one to your attack rolls, so it's an easier chance to hit. And you have additional lightning damage while you have the charges. Once you get the charges to five, they are consumed and your next attack will deal additional 1d8 lightning damage. There's going to be a lot of items listed here, so bear with me please. Uh, we're going to start with weapons here because there is going to be a choice that you have to make. So you have the Jolt Shooter Longbow. This gives you two charges when dealing damage with that weapon. You had the Sparky Points Trident, similar to the bow, gives you charges when dealing damage with that weapon. And you have the Spell Sparkler. This basically gives you lightning charges whenever you deal damage with a spell or a cantrip. All three of these are exclusive rewards whenever you go to the burning inn inside Joaquin's Rest. Once you complete that actual quest chain there, you have to pick one of these three. You can't have all three at once. Uh, starting with the Speedy Light Feet, these grant three charges after dashing. These are found at the Windmill Cellar inside the Blighted Village. You have the Water Sparkers, which grant three charges if you start your turn on an electrified surface. 
These are found in a chest behind Minthara at the Goblin Camp. You have the Sparky Hands, which grant two charges basically whenever you punch the enemy. Uh, they're essentially monk gloves and they're found here in the swamp inside Act 1. You have the Blast Pendant that allows you once per long rest, your next lightning spell or cantrip will deal additional damage equal to the amount of your lightning charges. And this is found off the drow we talked about earlier that is near the spectator fight. You have the Jolly Vest which is medium armor sold by Brem inside the hideout inside Act 1. Um, you have to complete the shipment quest in order to have access to this vendor. When taking damage with lightning charges, the attacker must succeed a deck saving throw or they become shocked. Sorry, I don't have good footage of the quest chain. Basically, you go inside the cave where the gnolls are, grab the chest, and do not lockpick it. It has to stay sealed, and then bring it to the hideout, and then you'll have access to the additional items from the vendor. You have the Lifebringer Helmet, and this just basically grants temporary hit points if you have lightning charges. This is sold by Blurg inside Act 1 in the Mushroom Colony. You have the Sparkwall Clothes. This gives you plus one bonus to spell DC and plus one to AC and saving throws if you have lightning charges. This is found in a chest basically at the end of a bridge inside Grimforge. And lastly, you have the shield, the Sparky Spark Wall, and this is found in a chest inside Grimforge. This shield grants basically a, a lightning aura skill, which you use as an action to consume all your charges, and it creates a massive like AoE blast around you that also applies the jolted condition. I do want to give a shout out to this ring here on screen now, because this will give you basically immunity to being electrified so if you are playing a caster that does a lot of lightning damage it'd be really nice to give this ring to one of your allies and the final category is for those who like to be stealthy or attack those in dim light these are all items that interact with that concept you have the shadow cloaked ring the wearer's weapon and unarmed attacks deal additional 1d4 damage against lightly or heavily obscured creatures and creatures made of shadow. You can loot this from the Shadow Mastiff Alpha inside the ruined battlefield. To summon him, all nearby torches have to be destroyed. You have the Ring of Twilight, which gives you plus 1 bonus to AC while you are obscured. And this is found inside the Traveler's Chest hidden behind some pots inside the ruined tower at the ruined battlefield you have the justice seer scimitar if you attack with advantage with this weapon you have a chance to blind your target it also has an incredible weapon action called the shadow soaked blow which allows you to strike your enemy adding your proficiency bonus to the damage and if the attack hits you do additional psychic damage and it doesn't break stealth or concealment, so you can use this and stay stealth and then open on the enemy again. This is found inside the Gauntlet of Shar here on the map. You'll have to fight a bunch of rats. After you do so and kill the mini boss, you can loot that along with a special shield. That special shield is the Justice Seer's Great Shield. You have advantage on perception checks but it also grants its own unique darkness spell that creates a cloud of magical darkness and immediately attempts to hide. There is the knife of the Undermountain King that pairs really well with the other weapon we just mentioned. This is sold by a vendor at the Githyanki Crash in the Mountain Pass. And to be honest, this is one of the best short swords in the entire game. You gain increased crit chance, it rerolls damage dice, and you have advantage on attack rolls against lightly or heavily obscured targets while using this weapon, so the chances are you're probably going to crit.
quartermaster tally at last lights in sells a uh, armor piece that allows you to while obscured you have advantage on saving throws and also grants stealth plus one underneath last lights in looted off some mobs is the covert cow this grants increased crit chance while you're obscured and gives you plus one to deck saving throws If you complete the Mind Flayer quest inside the Mushroom Colony, the vendor will actually sell a home for casters that will give you plus one bonus to spell save DC if you're obscured in shadow. Back in the Gauntlet of Shar are several items that you can actually have for the Dark Justice Seer set. Uh, this would include the Dark Justice Seer helmet, which is a much better version than the Covert Cow. This also includes the Dark Justice Seer Half Plate, and there's two versions of this. There's the Half Plate you get just for looting it, which gives you advantage on stealth checks while obscured and allows you to cast Shield of Faith as a bonus action. Minor spoiler for this next part, but if you choose the less than good route at the end of Shar's Gauntlet when it comes to the Night Song and you have Shadowheart with you, you can actually receive an upgraded version of this chest piece along with some other goodies. Those other goodies include the Dark Justice Seer Gauntlets. These allow you to cast its own unique spell called Beckoning Darkness that does damage anytime someone's in your darkness. It's really, really cool and it makes your attacks do additional necrotic damage as well. You have the Dark Justice Seer Boots, which literally gives you the ability to teleport from shadow to shadow like the Shadow Monks do. And you will receive Shar's Spear of Evening, which in my opinion is one of the coolest weapons in the game. You gain, you gain advantage on saving throws while lightly or heavily obscured. This weapon deals additional 1d6 damage to creatures that are lightly or heavily obscured. You gain immunity to blindness, which is actually insane because this affects magical spells as well like darkness. Furthermore, you gain a unique spell that can be used once per turn without a spell slot to cast Shar's Darkness, which is essentially a darkness spell, but for the weapon itself. And if that wasn't enough, besides having the plus three because it's a legendary weapon, it also has a unique weapon attack that basically casts a darkness cloud while attacking. It's pretty dang cool. In Act 3, you can buy a cape called the Shade Slayer Cloak from the Guild Hall in Lower City Sewers. This increases your chance to crit while hiding, and this crit chance does stack with everything else. And of course, there is the Deathstalker Mantle, a cape that you only receive for being the Dark Urge. This literally will turn you invisible after killing an enemy, and it lasts for two turns. There's plenty more items that affect stealth, but these are the ones, in my opinion, that are definitely worth getting in mind that I really liked using throughout my playthroughs. Up next, we're gonna be talking about Invenom, and this is all about poison interactions on the target. Targets that are poisoned, by the way, have disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks, so the chances they actually hit you in combat are gonna be a little low. If you are interested, I have a fun poison-based build around melee combat that you can check out down below. It's part of my Dritz video, link in the description. So items for this would include the Poisoner's Ring, which is sold by Moonglow inside Moonrise Towers. This allows you to cast Venom once per long rest, which basically means all your poison damage for the next few turns is going to be doubled against that target. And when you use this, it can hit multiple targets at once. There is a cloak that heals you for 1d4 whenever you poison a foe. This is found inside Balthazar's chambers in Moonrise Towers. There's the Poisoner's Gloves. Whenever you deal poison damage, the target needs to pass a constitution saving throw or they become poisoned. This works even against targets that are considered immune or resistant. You can find this north inside Act 2, uh, inside the House of Healing. You have the Thorn Blade, which is sold by Damon in Act 2. While concentrating on a spell, all melee attacks deal additional poison damage. This is really great for any type of dual wielders. There's a necklace called the Broodmother's Revenge. This is dropped by Kaga inside Act 1. Whenever you are healed, you gain additional poison damage 
that is added to your weapon attacks. This applies even when self-healing from the cloak mentioned earlier, and even at full HP when the cloak heals, this will still get applied. You have the Staff of Crones, which is looted after the Hag boss fight in Act 1. This staff grants you raised sickness that you can use once per short rest. And lastly, you have the Poisoner's Robe, dropped by the Spider Matriarch. Whenever you cast a spell that does poison damage, you now deal additional damage. Okay, next you have the ring that allows you to grant an ally bless after you heal them. Volo in Act 1 at Emerald Grove sells this. You can also buy it from him after you save him from the goblins as well. The bless effect will also proc on yourself if you heal yourself, including heals like the fighter self heal as well. In Arcane Tower, there is a staff at the bottom where you get the electrocution ring I talked about earlier that also gives you additional benefits for Bless. There's also some additional support items you can wear from vendors inside the Mushroom Colony. Okay, so let's start with some easy increased range damage. In the beginning of Act 1, you can find a pair of gloves from a goblin vendor that will give you proficiency with bows as well as increasing your damage. If you combine this with a strength increasing bow, there is a bow you can get from the hideout vendor that will give you additional damage equal to your strength modifier. And at the top of Arcane Tower, if you break a bench, you can get a club that will increase your strength to 19. If you combine all three of those together, even without any decks, you have an additional plus 6 damage, which is really nice. Arcane Synergy Helm and Ring can be found inside the Mountain Pass with the Gith Yankee. This increases your melee or range damage equal to your casting modifier. While you're inside the mountain pass, you might as well check out the vendor. She does have some other really nice items. One specifically will affect concentration. There's also a ring that will affect concentration. And while you're here, there are two elemental pieces as well. One will increase your cantrip scaling, and the other one will actually increase your melee damage based off a of cantrip that you cast. I'm sure everyone knows by now, but Minthara, if you decide to kill her in Act 1, has some really nice gear. And for some caster specific stuff, if you save the tieflings and rescue them from Moonrise Towers, you get a, an amazing chest piece. This will scale your cantrips equal to your charisma modifier. This thing does stack with other things we showed in this video. It's really powerful. And to the north here, uh, where this little kid is for a quest, there's a treasure chest that drops a ring that can help you apply mental fatigue to your enemies. Also a really great ring for casters. And that's all I have for this one, guys. I'm sure there's probably some other useful items inside the game, but I really wanted to showcase... A, some of the sets that I found that were just really fun to make builds around, and B, just some random items that honestly I really enjoyed playing throughout my multiple playthroughs of the game. So if you did like this video, please like and subscribe. This did take a while to make because I had to create a brand new file in order to get all the footage that I need. So hopefully you did enjoy, and if you did, comment down below what you liked. If you have any other items, go ahead and comment down below as well so other people can find out. And Really, if you want to see anything else like this, let me know. It's my first time making an item kind of like video, so hopefully it wasn't too bad. And of course, if you do want to see builds, definitely let me know, and I will try to make some builds revolving around the items showcased in this video. I'm Ronan. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.